صل على محمد وعلي محمد صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيم قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب قد آتيتني من العلم وعلمتني من تأويل الأحاديث فاطر السماوات والأرض أنت ولي في الدنيا والآخرة توفني مسلما وألحقني بالصالحين. Swain, so you're gathering with a remembrance of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Rasulullah and his honorable and purified progeny, recite the second salawat. <laughs> For Allah to shower onto this gathering with his infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahibul Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voice. <laughs> The Ottoman Empire was one of the most powerful empires around the world and within the course of history. An empire that governed and reigned for more than 600 years in the name of the religion of Islam. An empire with vast territory 
the vastest territory that had ever been governed by any Muslim ruler. 44 of today's countries were under the governance and the power and authority of the Ottoman Sultan. All the way from the heart of Europe to the entire of Asia, Africa, the seas and the oceans around them were under the absolute control of the Ottomans. An empire that has a great history with fascinating events, with extremely influential personalities, a period of Islamic history that needs to be examined and understood thoroughly. The personalities of the Ottoman Empire must be studied and understood by every Muslim. 600 years of the history of Islam is indeed not something that can be overlooked. Major events within the history of the Ottomans, such as the conquest of the Muslims to the Christian land, the defeat of the Christendom or the Christian Empire on the hands of the Muslim army, the treatment of the Muslims towards the non-Muslims, the treatment of the Muslim king or sultan towards the Christian holy lands or the churches, towards the synagogues, towards the minorities, towards other ethnicities, the relationship of the sultan, the Muslim sultan, with other governments, and specifically the Roman Empire. The relationship of the Ottomans with other Muslims. Specifically, one of the most important parts of examining the Ottoman Empire is examining the very first clash between a Sunni state represented by the Ottomans and a Shia state represented by the Safawis. This was the very first clash in the history of Islam between two states, two separate Muslim states. One represented the Shia and one represented the majority which was the Sunni Islam. The very first clash, the political clash between two governments occurred during the reign of the Ottomans. And today, brothers and sisters, we are here to, com to commemorate the 40th of Al Imam Abu Abdullah Al Hussein. <laughs> and if you read in his ziyara, in the ziyara of Al Imam Abu Abdullah Al Hussein of the 40th of Arba'een, the most important segment of the ziyara says that he gave his sacrifice and he gave his blood Imam Hussein gave his blood and this great sacrifice and he embarked on the journey towards Karbala so that he can do one Enlighten the minds of the humans. And two, allow them to escape from the darkness of confusion. This is how we salute Imam al Hussein on the 40th. We say, You gave everything that you have so that you can educate the children of Adam, the humans. So that they can escape from confusion and darkness and ignorance into enlightenment. And of course, we are ought to align ourselves with the principles of Imam al Hussein. We have to remind ourselves of the mission statement of Imam al Hussein. And Imam al Hussein made it very easy for us. 
he laid out his mission statement. And he allows this mission statement to echo until the end of time for those who want to truly understand Hussein and the movement of Hussein. Because sometimes we believe Imam al Hussein's movement was a revolution, an uprising against injustice, and that's about it. In fact, what is highlighted by the Ma'soom and the Ziyarah of Arba'een is something much greater than just standing against the unjust ruler of the time who was Yazid ibn Muawiyah. No. لِيَسْتَنْقِذَ عِبَادَكَ مِنَ الْجَهَالَةِ the movement was to allow human beings to escape from jahiliyyah and ignorance. Because when you are a jahil, then you put your hands in the hands of the zalim. When you live in a state of ignorance, then you find injustice to be something normal. A normal society. <coughs> but when you escape from confusion and darkness and enter the realm of knowledge, then you no longer can avoid injustice. And Imam al-Hussein says this, when he began his journey from Medina to Mecca and then to the land of Iraq, he says, Inni lam akhruj ashiran, wala batiran, wala mufsida, bal kharajtu li islahi ummati jaddi. Rasulillah, likay amura bil ma'roofi wa anha anil munkar. It says, I did not embark on this journey for the sake of popularity and fame and position and power, but to perfect the ummah of my grandfather Rasulullah. And perfecting the ummah of Rasulullah and the perfecting the Muslim ummah cannot happen, brothers and sisters, without knowledge and education, without escaping from darkness of ignorance, of jahiliyyah. And I kid you not, sometimes we allow the central theme of our majalis and this mimbar not to be the most important and contemporary issues in the Muslim community. But we constantly speak of repetitive, exhausted topics that have been discussed for so many years on so many pulpits. And yet we entertain them. Today, the central theme around the Shia world is the importance of Azadari. How important is it that we revive Azadari? And we sit sometimes on the member and we bash those who do not believe, for example, that Dhul Janah was a white, beautiful stallion with supernatural powers. Let's talk about that for 10 nights. To tell the people that, look, this horse was very special. If you don't do Azadari in this specific way, then Imam al Hussein is in danger. Then the fate of Shi'ism is at risk. <coughs> the fate of Shi'ism is at risk when we do the Azadari without knowing the mission of Imam al Hussein. Without knowing what was the purpose of Imam al Hussein. The future of Shi'ism is at risk when the youth no longer understand the very core principles of Islam because we have been discussing the small, tiny, insignificant, unimportant matters over and over and over again while forgetting the bigger picture and the greatest of challenges that we face. While forgetting to discuss the future of Islam, for example, in this country. Our youth today face a great challenge. Not our youth. We face this challenge as well, brothers. I tell you, an average individual living in the West, specifically in America and Europe, that gets in and out of college, specifically at the master's and PhD level, listen to this, knows more about Islam than an average Muslim. I kid you not. Because there are courses that they have to take. There's research that has to be done. An average non-Muslim doing a master's on Islam 
would have to read the Quran at least once from cover to cover while con contemplating on the verses and the chapters. And then here is this Muslim guy at college, at work, behind his desk, and he's asked by a non Muslim fella, by a non Muslim friend, explain to me, for example, this chapter 9. Why is it that your merciful God speaks of the killing of innocent people? Kill them wherever you see them. <coughs> Why is it that your Quran that you claim speaks of mercy and compassion has commands from the Creator to kill other human beings? How is this merciful? Why is it that your Prophet, for example, had more than four wives? According to your Quran, you can have four, but why is it that your prophet had more than four wives? Why is it that, for example, Muslims fought non-Muslims for hundreds and thousands of years and took the captives as prisoners and treated them less than human beings, dehumanized them? And here's the average Muslim. What is our response? There, if you quote Nadim Sarvar, it's not going to help you. There, if you read five nawhas, ten are haidaris, the guy will laugh at your face. There, we need to understand the Quran, and there, we need to have an understanding. A full understanding of Islamic history. Don't tell me, well, I don't agree with the Islamic history. First Khalifa, second Khalifa, third Khalifa, Muawiyah, Yazid. Well, I don't agree with them. So all I need to say is I don't agree with them. Huh. There is something called Islamic history. Events that happened in the name of the religion of Islam. You have to understand them when they, hap when they happened. What happened and why is it that you disagree with them? And that is how we can become ambassadors and representatives of the religion of Islam today. <coughs> I ask you, today, if we make a challenge, and I believe me, I'm not speaking about specific communities, whether it's this one or other communities, I'm, spe I'm, spe I'm speaking generally. But our general public that adheres to the school of Ahl al-Bayt, right? If we manage to bring five of them and say, write for me the first 20 chapters of the Qur'an, the name of the first 20 chapters of the Qur'an, write them down. How many of them do you think will pass? But now, write for me the name of ten Nawhakhans. Everyone will pass. So what went wrong? I'll tell you what went wrong. When we misunderstand the job of this member, when we allow this member to deter from the path that it needs to be on, when this member no longer speaks the truth, when this member no longer becomes the source of knowledge to enlighten the human minds and those who attend the member, it becomes a form of entertainment. Today, we choose to discuss the Ottoman Empire. Well, Sayyid, what does that have to do with Arba'in and Imam al-Hussein? You will realize that every event that took place after the demise of Rasulullah until the very collapse of the Ottoman Empire has played a role in the Islam that you believe in today. That is why I started the series, this Muharram and Safar, Islam between originality and distortion. Events took place after the demise of Rasulullah. Personalities came and went. 
that every single one of them played a role in distorting the originality of the religion of Islam. Today, there is something that we understand to be as the religion of Islam, whether it's Sunni Islam or Shia Islam. Is it the original message of Islam? Is it that which the Prophet wasallam brought with him? Is it the message of the Quran? Let's ask ourselves. When we come and re-examine Islamic history and the events that have taken place in the name of the religion of Islam, which have nothing to do with the religion of Islam, have slowly crawled into the Islamic ideology. Today there is something called Islamic ideology that has nothing to do with the originality of Islam. For example, stoning. Bring someone and say, is stoning part of the religion of Islam? They tell you, yes. Has it happened? Of course it happens. It happens until today in Muslim countries. Where is it in the Quran? It's nowhere to be found in the Quran. Did Rasulullah stone anybody due to any sort of sins? Never. Did Amir al muminin stone anyone? Never. Did any of the Imams participate in such an event? Never. But it's crawled into the Islamic ideology and today it's a principal belief, a cardinal belief into the minds of Muslims where it's so difficult to erase it out of their minds. The killing of innocent people. Today what you see happening around the Muslim world, don't think it's an innovative process. It just happened today. This has been happening since the demise of Rasulullah until today. It's a norm. It's a part of the Islamic history. The amputation of hands and legs and the severing of heads. This has happened since the very beginning of the era after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Inshallah, on the next upcoming night, I will speak to you of the Jewish influence on the books of hadith. The books of hadith that you have today. We open those books and we read hadiths in those books. A lot of it is the influence of those Jews who converted to the religion of Islam to infiltrate the religion of Islam. Jewish ideology that has now become part and parcel of the Islamic ideology. So here is 600 years of Islamic history that has definitely had the most influence on the religion of Islam today that remains to be ignored. Why? Because we have nothing to do with the Ottomans. Why should we study them? Today the conflict, if you see conflict, Sunni, Shia conflict, it began at the time of the Ottomans and the Safawis. Go study the beginning of the conflict, you, better, you will better understand the conflict today. Obviously, many scholars have praised the Ottomans. Sunni and Shia scholars. Why? Because they'll tell you this was a period when Christianity collapsed on the hands of the Muslims. When Islam was able to take over all of Europe. Not only that, but when they took over Europe, nothing changed. No churches were demolished. No synagogues were demolished. Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived peacefully amongst themselves. And that is true. After the conquest of the Ottomans to any Christian land, nobody was harassed. They gave them three days for those who wanted to leave. They leave. And those who remained will remain living their lives. Nobody was forced to actually convert to the religion of Islam. And that is true. The greatest army ever was the Ottoman Empire. Nobody can dare to stand against the Ottoman Sultan.
He controlled the seas and the oceans and the lands and had the most powerful army. And he knocked at the doors of Rome and became the worst nightmare to the Vatican. So he is praised. He's glorified. One of the greatest of personalities, a Sultan Suleiman, also known as Suleiman the Magnificent, Sultan Suleiman the Wise, Sultan Suleiman the Conqueror, and many. He used to sign his name as the shadow of God. The shadow of God on earth. And he truly believed he was the shadow of God on earth. And he truly believed that God has endorsed him to become his Khalifa. You see, after the demise of Rasulullah, the first Khalifa was Khalifa to Rasulullah. The second Khalifa also called himself Khalifa to Rasulullah. The third Khalifa called himself Khalifa to Rasulullah. But the Ottoman called himself Khalifa to Allah. I represent God. And if you stand against me, then you stand against God. Anyhow, he is praised. He's praised for a lot of accomplishments. But however, let us truly come and examine one of their personalities. Sultan Suleiman, the 10th Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. He became a Sultan at the age of 26. He was gone out hunting and he had a very close friend who was a Greek convert by the name of Ibrahim al-Barmaki. His name prior to his conversion to Islam is not known. They were out hunting and a letter reached. So Ibrahim opened the letter, then he bowed to Suleiman. Suleiman realized that now he is the ultimate Sultan. He went to Istanbul and he, with the help of this Ibrahim, put together the most powerful army and they began their conquests of Europe. And go and read history. No power can stand against the Sultan. In fact, sometimes some cities would surrender at the sound of the drums of the Ottoman army. Their drums were so loud and they scared off the others so much that, that they would surrender just by hearing the drums. And obviously, the empire expanded and expanded. But during that period, Sultan Suleiman killed the chief wazir. And he appointed Ibrahim who was more than a brother to him as the chief wazir. And then he married him to his own sister, Khadija. And years later, cut the head of Ibrahim in front of everyone. And then he appointed another chief wazir, who was also his brother-in-law. And a year later, also cut his head in front of everyone. And he appointed his son, Mustafa, as the commander of chief of his armed forces and then killed his own son with his bare hands in front of everyone. And then he killed his second son and he killed his third son and his fourth son died out of depression and fear. And he made his last son kill the one before last. So the person who succeeded him was his son Bayazid. When Bayazid succeeded his father Suleiman, he killed 40 people, 40 members, 40 men out of his own family. 19 of them was, were his own brothers. The majority of them were infants. Infants, three months old, kill him. Five months, kill him. Six months old, kill him. Annihilated every possibility of anybody that can come and possibly take away 
this power and this reign from the Sultan? Which kind of Sultan? Which kind of representation of Islam and Allah would kill his own children? Would kill his own family members? In fact, it became part of the practice of the Ottomans that the Sultan would then have to kill every single one of his brothers. The day that he becomes a Sultan is the day of the funeral of every one of his brothers. They take out caskets one after another. At some point, 60 caskets would come out of the palace of the Sultan, of his own brothers. Why? Because there was a possibility that when this kid grows up, he's going to want to take the power away from the Sultan. How was this all possible? It was all possible because they created a position by the name of Shaykh al-Islam. What was the role of Shaykh al-Islam? The role of Shaykh al-Islam was to give permission on behalf of God to the Sultan to kill his own son. To kill his own brother-in-law. To kill his own chief wazir. The Sultan would call Shaykh al-Islam. Shaykh al-Islam would come and he would say, I suspect that my son has his eyes on the throne. What should I do? He says, this throne belongs to Allah. And whoever stands against it is kafir, even if, it's, even if he is your own son. So I permit you to kill him. And then the king kills his own son. Kills his own family members. Kills his own sister. In the name of the religion of Islam. More importantly, when we discuss the power of the Ottoman Empire at the seas and the oceans and the collapse of the Christian Empire at the hands of the Muslims, what was happening? In one shipment, the chief of the Ottoman Navy brings 30,000 women as captives to the, to the Sultan. 30,000 women as captives to the Sultan all the way from Sicily to Italy to Spain, Germany, Vienna, you name it. The Sultan chooses 20% of them as the booties of war. Then he sells the rest of them at the markets. The Ottoman Sultan never married. He had concubines. One, two, ten. No, five thousand. Ten thousand. Each one would receive one evening with the Sultan. The representative of God. The representative of Allah, the representative of the Quran, the representative of Rasulullah. If she conceives a child, then she becomes the mother of the Amir, the prince. If she doesn't, then she's released from her duties until someone else takes her position. Castrated men. Men, free men who lived freely in their own countries once the sultan and his armed forces would enter a country then they take those boys and those men and they castrate them and they bring them into the palace of the king of the sultan and his wazirs and then the rest of the people can purchase them off the market this was the history of islam those individuals represented the religion of Islam. Now, with that said, imagine what kind of corruption would take place into the area of preaching the religion of Islam. This is, what, when I, this is my introduction. Now I want to bring you to the actual facts. So the most important parts of this discussion this evening. Now imagine when the Sultan, who is the representative of God, who is the shadow of God on earth, 
does this form of injustice and here is a scholar a Muslim scholar who wants to preach the Sultan publicly drinks the Sultan has 5,000 concubines castrated boys in his palace the Sultan murders his own children what can you preach about now you think that you have the freedom to preach what you want you think you have the freedom to preach the true teachings of Islam you think if you're an author at that period of time you can write books and articles and research release research about the true teachings of Islam absolutely not Islam and its principles were also controlled if you wanted to take the pulpit and speak of Islam you would have to have a permission from one of the wazirs appointed by the Sultan and if you took the pulpit without the permission of this wazir who represents the Sultan that gives you permission to speak he gives you a clearance on your name your name is clear you may go and preach but if you don't have such a clearance what happens very simple they cut your head publicly if you are an advocate of change what happens they take them the same day to the court and the Islamic judge says that this man advocates people against the Sultan who represents Allah and therefore he receives the death punishment and they execute the man or woman publicly today when you hear of Khashukchi and how he disappeared at the embassy and what happened Habibi this is this has been happening this is part of Islamic history the forefathers of Islamic history and the Sultans that existed in the Ottoman Empire and prior to them in Bani al-Abbas and prior to them in Bani, Bani Umayyah set such a paradigm for the rulers today for those in power today if you want to know why is it that the Muslim rulers today have absolutely nothing to do with Islam and how is it possible that they fear not any of the teachings of Allah then you must know that they have been following the same footsteps there there was Shaykh al-Islam and the Ottoman Empire and today in Saudi Arabia there is also Shaykh al-Islam and Shaykh al-Islam they tell him we want you to make something haram halal he makes it halal we want you to make something that is halal haram he makes it haram very easy the visitation of the graves which is halal make it haram he comes out and makes it haram the visitation of Ahl al-Bayt honoring Rasulullah which is part of the religion of Islam make it haram he makes it haram the killing of innocent people which is haram make it halal he makes it halal in fact the establishment of every empire after the Khilafa the so-called rightly guided Khilafa Abu Bakr Uthman Abu Bakr Umar Uthman Ali and Imam Hassan Imam Ali and Imam Hassan after this period which was then the period of Bani Umayyah and Bani al-Abbas if you study this period you realize that the greatest amount of corruption that occurred was due to the fact that there were corrupt scholars there there were corrupt scholars allowing such injustice not just to occur but to multiply And, and people revolted and the revolts and the revolutions were stopped 
Every person revolting was killed. Sometimes their bodies were crucified for four years by the Muslim Khalifa. The establishment of Bani al-Abbas, the establishment of Bani al-Abbas came about because Bani Umayyah had created classes between every society, the Arabs and the non-Arabs. Within the Arabs, different tribes have different classifications. The non-Arabs had different classifications. The Persians, the Indians, the Chinese, the Every classification of non-Arabs received differently from Bayt al-Mal and were treated differently from Bayt al-Mal. So there was an uprising that started. Some people don't understand that the uprising of Bani al-Abbas started with the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. It started in Kufa. And the, the very first slogan of Bani al-Abbas was Ar-Ridha min Ali Muhammad. We want to bring back Ahl al-Bayt and al-Muhammad into the picture so that they can govern the Islamic society. They stood against this injustice, mobilized people against injustice as soon as the very first Khalifa of Bani al-Abbas came, mass murdered every one of the individuals who helped him rise, help him, helped him in this revolution and, and helped him seek victory against Bani Umayyah. And similarly, the corruption became so much that the Ottomans revolted against Bani al-Abbas and had their own establishment and reigned for 600 years. But I'll tell you this, the day that Ataturk gained power and the Ottoman Empire collapsed, you know that hijab was forbidden. This Islam was so corrupt that we no longer want to have anything to do with it. If Islam says hijab, hijab is forbidden. You know the amama was the dress code of the Ottomans. It became forbidden. You cannot wear amama in Turkey. Adhan, forbidden. Salah, forbidden. Drinking publicly. Why? Because this Islam that they saw was the Islam of the sword, the Islam of killing, the Islam of enslaving people, the Islam of amputating hands and limbs, the Islam of injustice, the Islam that has nothing to do with mercy. Now you come to the Holy Quran. If I want to praise anybody, I praise them if their characteristics and their actions follow the teachings of the Quran. Sometimes that can be a Muslim ruler, and at other times, he does not have to have a Muslim title. But his act is Islamic. The way he rules is Islamic. In the end of chapter 12, at the age of Yusuf, at the end of the, at the, end of the life of the Prophet Yusuf, the Prophet Yusuf makes a dua. Allah records it in the Quran. Rabbi. Oh Allah. Rabbi. And the re why does he say Rabbi? Why does he not say, for example, Ilahi? Ya Allah. He says Rabbi. Rabbi comes from the root word Murabbi. Murabbi is the one that gives ethics, morality. He says, Allah, at the end of my journey, I see you as my Rabb. The one who gives me ethics. The one who gives me morals. The one who disciplines me. Rabbi. Same thing with Musa. Musa, also when he discusses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where? In Mount Sinai. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inni ana rabbuka. Says, does not say, Inni ana Allah. Inni ana rabbuka faqna'na alayk innaka bil wadi al When he was in Mount Sinai, and Allah tells him to take off his sandals because he is in the holiest of lands. Allah says, I am your Rabb. Here, again, Yusuf speaks to Allah with the word Rabb, Murabbi, meaning the task of the prophets. The cardinal principle within their job description 
is to receive morality from Allah and to give that morality to the people. It's not to force them into salah or siyam or hajj or zakat or khums or to turn them into sheep. In fact, I'll tell you this. One day Musa, he was, you know, Musa was a shepherd. So he saw another shepherd and the shepherd was saying, I wish you were here so I can comb your hair. And I wish you were here so I can take out the lice from your hair. And I wish you were here so I can massage your feet. And I wish you were here so I can bathe you. So Musa came and said to him, who are you speaking to? He says, I'm speaking to God. Musa says, you blasphemous person. I think God has hair and you want to massage his feet and you want to bathe him. Shame on you. You don't know how to speak to God. Three days pass and Jibra'il comes to Musa. Musa, shame on you. Why? He says, for 40 years, Allah enjoyed the conversation of this shepherd, the dua of this shepherd. And for three days, this shepherd has gone silence, out of shame. He no longer speaks to Allah. Allah misses his voice. Allah misses his ibadah. This was his ibadah. Instead of teaching him, you stopped his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be a murabbi, O Musa. You have to teach them. Do not create a, a disconnection between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes, brothers, we truly do that. Our organizations, sometimes some scholars, sometimes some people in the important positions of power of our Islamic institutions, they don't know how to create a further bond. But sometimes we are expert in creating the disconnection. When somebody, we don't like him, we don't like his views, we don't like the way she looks, we don't like the way she wears hijab, we don't like the, you know, the Instagram posts they have. We disrespect them. Throw them out of our communities. You don't belong here. While well, what we learn from Imam al Hussein, when Hur came to him, the sinner of all sinners, Imam al Hussein didn't judge him. He says, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah, wa alayka assalamu man ant. He then confesses his sin. He says, Ana alladhi ja'ja'a bikum al tariq. I am the one who caused all this. So Imam al Hussein realizes this man knows he is guilty. Imam al Hussein knows this man is confessing of his crime. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, hal yi min tawbah? The response from Imam al Hussein says, Tub tab Allahu alayk. Imam al Hussein even gave a chance to Hur. Truly, let's ask ourselves, would we give a chance to a person like Hur? Would we? In our organizations? So Yusuf, coming back to our discussion, says, Rabbi, you've given me this tarbiya. I have become Yusuf. You've given me knowledge. And my miracle is that I know the interpretation of dreams. To you belongs my dunya and my akhirah. To you belongs this universe. تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا وَأَلْحَقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ Allow me to depart as a Muslim from this dunya. And allow me to reunite with the Salihin, meaning his forefathers and the Anbiya and the Awliya. This is the principle of an Islamic ruler and this is the way he must depart this dunya. So when I come to Sultan Sulaiman, or I come to other Sultans, or I come to other Khulafa, or whoever they may be, I bring them their legacy and their history, and I bring the Quran, and I put them next to each other. Did he follow the Quran? Can he and will he depart as a Muslim? What is a Muslim? We sometimes think a Muslim is a person whose name is Muhammad, and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. 
This is not the definition of Islam in accordance to the Quran. When the Quran says Musliman means submissive, allow me to die at the full stage of submissiveness to you, Ya Allah. And a person who goes around murdering his own family and children, is he a Muslim for the sake of power? Inshallah, tomorrow, brothers, we will discuss, and within the next four nights, we will discuss the Safawi Empire and its influence on Shia ideology. And that is going to be one of the most eye-opening experiences for us. And then we will discuss how this clash between Shia politics and Sunni politics, between a Shia state and a Sunni state, has even infiltrated some of our ideologies and even within the books of our ahadith. But I tell you, before I conclude and go into the masa'ib, I'll tell you this. Sometimes we praise a Muslim ruler, Muslim scholars and historians, praise a Muslim ruler because of the fact that he had a powerful army. Because of the, pa because of the fact that the entire world at the time submitted to his power. And we sometimes follow along. Of course, Sultan Suleiman took over the entire world. How can we not, in the name of Islam, how could we not praise him? And then history repeats itself and you see the contemporary issues today. Saudi Arabia. They have waged a war against their neighboring country who are Muslims and they're suffering from malnutrition and they are dying on daily basis and they kill innocent people but because of the fact that they have power and, and money and nobody's willing to speak the truth and that is how the history of Islam sometimes becomes an extremely shameful history an embarrassment and we come to, for example, some non-Muslims, whether they are in political positions or positions of power in their society, who are not Muslim by name, but they were Muslim by act. And we say, we wonder, will they go to Jannah or where? Uh, because this guy, he's Muslim. So he has to go to Jannah. But for example, this person who is full of humanity, humility, submission to God, we wonder, will they make it or not? What? Is, is Jannah in my hand? Or did Allah just create Jannah for people with the name of Muslims, you know, just, just by their IDs, as long as it says Muslim, Allah, they go to Jannah. Are we fooling ourselves? Are we fooling Allah? Who are we fooling here? A Muslim is a Muslim by act. A Muslim is a Muslim by their akhlaq and mannerism. Today you have non-Muslim employees that will tell their employer, employees, employers will tell their employees, you want to go to your Arba'een, you want to go to Iraq, to your pilgrimage, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll give you a paid leave. We will honor you because you're going to do a pilgrimage for the sake of your religion, belief. And you will have Muslim employees that will tell you, if you leave, we'll fire you. If you go and come back to Muslim countries, if you go to Vegas and gamble and drink and do all sorts of things, and go back to those Muslim countries, welcome back home. But if they know that you've gone to Karbala, what do they do? They take away your passport. Come back tomorrow. Let's see what fine we're going to give you. Why? Because you went to the ziyar of Imam al Hussein. And truly, the essence of the movement of Imam al Hussein was exactly this. So Islam does not remain just a name. Islam does not just remain a title for people. But the principles of Islam, the akhlaq of Islam, the morality of Islam lives amongst us. And that is why he is the rescuer of the message of Adam and Nuh and Musa and Isa and all the rest of the prophets. And that is why 
his grandfather on multiple occasions stands and says, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn, ahabba Allah man ahabba Husayn. Unfortunately, we didn't make it amongst the za'areen of Aba Abdullah. But fortunately enough, we made it to his majalis to commemorate his honor to commemorate his principles, to stand and salute him all the way from the city of New York to Karbala, to say to him, Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana, inna tawajjahna, wastashfa'na, wa tawassalna bika ila Allah. Ya Sayyidana wa Mawlana, إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا يا وجيها عند الله اشفع لنا عند الله يا وجيها Brothers, imagine yourself at the shrine of Imam Al Hussein. Imagine yourself standing alongside the millions of Za'ireen and now raise your voice Ya wajihan inda Allah Let us remember the moment after the 10th of Muharram the moments in which Imam Zainul Abideen would recall before every meal, before every time he drank water, before every time he rested, for the rest of his life, he would be witness crying. And sometimes he would overcry. They tell him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, so many years have passed since Karbala. Why do you still cry every time you see water? Why do you still, still cry every time you see a meal? Why do you still cry every time you sit under a shadow? And he would remind them. He would remind them that I am the son of the man who died thirsty next to the Euphrates. And that man was the grandson of Rasulullah, Al Imam Abu Abdullah Al Hussein. I am the son of the man who him and his companions were slain and beheaded hungry. But the most of my cries is for the moments that I saw the orphans of my father Hussein, the orphans of Ahl al-Bayt running from one tent to another while their dresses and their clothes had caught on fire. And I would see and I would imagine and I would recall my aunt Zainab running after one child and one orphan to gather them. Allahu Akbar, in those moments when they came and they burned down the tents, as Sayyid Zainab gathered all the orphans. When they gathered the orphans, the first thing they did was they said, Umar ibn Sa'd said, now you can give those children water. They came. And they would offer those children water, but they would not drink. So one of them, one of the daughters of Imam al Hussein, she took the water and she poured it on the, on the ground. They asked her, they said to her, why don't you drink? She says, how can I drink when my father and my uncles, when my brothers and my nephews were all slain, thirsty next to the Euphrates? Then they told them they have to leave. They have to leave the land of Karbala. So as Sayyid Zainab put everyone into their position on the back of the camels. And there was no one to help her embarked on her, embark on her own camel. 
So she looked towards the Euphrates. She says, Abbas, my brother, you were the one who brought us. You were the one who protected us. You were the one who allowed us to arrive safely to Karbala. Where are you? When I am most in need of you, then she paused and she responded. She says, how can you come and help me when they have suffered your right? And they have suffered your left arm. This is how the camp of Imam al Hussein left the city of Karbala. And 40 days later, Zainab and the children arrived back to Karbala as the visitors of the shrines and the graves of the Shuhada. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect every za'ar of Imam al Hussein. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though we did not make it amongst the za'areen, to write our names amongst the za'areen of Imam al Hussein, amongst the khuddam and the servants of Imam al Hussein. Let us raise our hands in a dua. Nas'aluka Allahumma wa nad'uka bismika al-azim al-a'zam, al-azz al-ajal al-akram, ten times. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, O Allah. Every man and woman present in this majlis with a sin, forgive our sins. With a haja, give us our hajat. O Allah, every person with an illness in this majlis, shower unto them from your cure. اللهم ادخل على أهل القبور السرور اللهم شافي وعافي كل مريض سد فقرنا بغناك غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اقضي عنا الدين وأجرنا من الفقر إنك على كل شيء قدير Let us rise please and recite دعاء الفرج بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك